Hello everyone, my well, name is Clay, and, and I am Terminally Nerdy. To Today, we'll be spending a nerdy now. moment taking a if look at and reviewing the, the action and RPG and Warhammer Chaos Bane. Set in the old world of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, how does this game hold up against its contemporaries like Diablo III, Path of Exile, Last Epoch, and so on? Let's find out! As a note, I want to make it clear that I love the Warhammer Fantasy and 40k universes. I played the tabletop war games for both years ago, Orcs and Chaos Space Marines for the win, so I know a bit here and there about the lore and setting of both universes. Visually, Chaos Bane nails the aesthetic of the Warhammer universe. The areas you visit such as Nuln ooze with the style of the tabletop game and the lore therein. Further, the character designs of the heroes, as well as their armor and weapons, perfectly fit into the Warhammer Fantasy traditional looks. My elf archer, Elsa, wore items and wielded bows that fit perfectly with how a wood elf miniature and characters appear in the official game. Enemy designs, however, are average at best. Most of the time you're fighting cultist mooks with the occasional demon thrown in for good measure. I would have liked to have seen something else. Thankfully, if you have the Tomb Kings DLC, you do get to fight undead! But only in that act, and the in-game progression maps, and not during the main campaign at all. There is a big issue here with visual repetition, in fact. With action RPGs, we tend to have each act themed after a particular region or map or style. In Diablo 2, for instance, Act 3 is all jungle and Act 2 is all desert. Chaos Bane does not buck this trend, but does it very poorly. See, in each act in Chaos Bane, there is a particular zone or theme attached to it. Act 1 takes place in the city of Nome, for instance. However, your missions are not one continuous map, but rather discrete levels that you enter in from a hub. And there's only like two tile sets used and about three prefab map layouts for each tile. I have seen the same sewer system with the same layout of enemies, chests, and paths in the first act alone about six to seven times. The same city tile set and layout three to four times in Act 1. There is no sense of progression visually or otherwise because of this. And because there is little variation to how the maps are laid out, and with what tile sets and enemy types are in each area, you feel like you're spinning your wheels a whole lot. Act 2, it's all inside another city. And you again repeat the same city tile sets with two to three map layouts. Act 3, snowy forests. Act 4, another realm. Each time it's the same 2-3 to three map layouts repeated with the same single tile set, so it feels like you're running the same missions over and over and over again with slightly different objectives. By the time I beat Act 4, I was honestly tired of it and felt drained. And I had only played for 11 hours, but it felt like an eternity. Now one thing I didn't expect was the voice acting. Each character has a unique voice, as do many of the story NPCs, and the voice acting is fantastic. It again feels appropriate to Warhammer Fantasy. I truthfully wish that there was more, but the dialogue that does exist is pretty thin overall. As well, the music, uh, I couldn't even tell you. I'm sure there is a soundtrack, but it was so beyond ambient that I generally had YouTuber Twitch streams going while playing, and the sound effects are okay, but nothing special. Really, there's nothing memorable here as far as I'm concerned for the soundtrack. Now let's talk about the story, and there will be some slight spoilers here, not that it really matters very much. Warhammer Fantasy is rich in lore and heroes and stories, but this game's story is... average at best. You play as one of the heroes who made up the retinue of Magnus the Pious, the man who reunited the Emperor of Man and beat back the Chaos Holds in the Great War! At the start of the game, a strange event happens in the night sky, awakening your chosen hero, who upon entering the courtyard of the palace sees Chaos Cultist storming Magnus' tower. You give chase, challenge a Chaos Sorceress, who puts a curse on Magnus, and you are unfortunately defeated in this case, and then you're found by a Witch Hunter and Teclas, the High Lore Master of Hayoth. From there, you are given different missions in an effort to find a way to cure Magnus of his curse, saving the Emperor of Man, while also defeating the horrible Chaos Cultists. Early on, I was hooked on the missions, but I became less and less interested as the story went on. The actual structure of the story consists of go to a map, kill enemies or find object, leave map, return to hub, talk to Teclas or the Witch Hunter, and repeat. 
And after about 10 to 15 missions, you go on a boss mission for the act. And the ending is just sort of there. Once you beat the four main acts, you are left to play the DLC for the Tomb Kings, which is unconnected to the main plot, or the free act update, The Forges of Gnome, which is also unconnected to the main plot. Normally, this would be the point where I would talk about these two acts, uh, but I frankly can't find it in me to finish them. Tomb Kings came with my Magnus Edition purchase, and Forges of Gnome is free to everybody who owns the base game. However, Forges adds the only mechanical thing to the game, which is a new class, the Dwarf Engineer, which I did try, and I found that she doesn't fit my playstyle. But beyond that, both are self-contained storylines separated from the main narrative. Everything they add is contained within their areas and doesn't cross over to the main campaign. And, as I will touch on shortly with character progressions, the fact that I was at the level cap already did not help my urge to continue. So, just how do you progress through this game? Why? By choosing a hero to build up to great and powerful heights! There are five heroes in the game, consisting of the Empire Soldier, the High Elf Mage, the Dwarf Slayer, the Wood Elf Archer, which is the one I played, and Dwarven Engineer. The Dwarven Engineer specifically comes with Forges of Gnome, which again is free for everybody. Like most action RPGs, you have a left and right click bindable skill, then four hotkeys for a total of six skills you can equip. You learn new skills as you advance in level, both active skills and passive skills, and you can equip six passive skills total at any one time as well. Skills are broken up into two types, resource builders and resource spenders. Now, most skills have three ranks to them, which can change how they behave. For instance, one of the Elf Archer Builder skills starts by shooting an arrow that deals physical damage and bounces to another nearby enemy. Rank 2, however, changes the damage type to Poison and increases how much damage it deals slightly. Rank 3 converts the damage back to Physical, increases the damage again, and makes it chain further and more enemies. However, you will never be able to equip every skill and rank you want because this game also has skill points for active and passive skills. By level 50, you will have 100 skill points to use on your 6 active and 6 packs of skills in total. Your builders will take either 0 points to equip, 4 points to equip, or 8 points to equip based on their rank. Your spenders will be 5, 10, and 15. Your passives will be 4, 8, and 12. This means that you have to make hard choices on what rank and what skills you equip. And that's not including the god skills you can learn from your god skill passive tree. The god passive tree is this big talent tree that grants you small bonuses each time you put a point in it. It looks very similar to Path of Exile's passive tree, only much smaller, and you will only ever have 50 points to put into it. Along the path are active and passive skills you can learn to customize your build further. Every class gets one single god passive tree. Unless you spend $8 on a DLC to buy a set of secondary god passive trees for each character! The god passive trees, if you have both, are not exclusive, meaning you can put points into both. And after playing with the DLC installed from the start, you want it. If you're going to play this game, you want the second god passive tree, because having access to both gives you the best options for customization. If I had only had the base tree for my archer, she would not have felt nearly as good as she did having access to both. I'm not a fan of this, of gating actual in-game skills and things behind a paywall at all. DLC acts and stories are one thing, but taking a full skill tree and saying, you can't have this unless you pay me, is a bit much. Now, the level cap of this game is 50, not 100. And I hit the level cap before I even finished Act 4. Once you hit the level cap, you get access to Legend Ranks, much like Diablo 3, but they're very boring in my opinion. Each Legend Rank tanks a point to increase its chance to activate, and then another point to increase its potency. For example, one of the Legend perks is gain a percent chance to cause an explosion when hitting an enemy with an attack, dealing Y damage. One point will increase the chance to trigger by 0.5%, and the other will increase the damage of the explosion by like 3. Grinding out these ranks just didn't feel good for me, and I realized that without more passive points or skill points, my character was basically complete. There were no new skills to learn as I played because I had hit the level cap. 
all I could do was grind legend points for subpar, uninteresting legend skills, and get more gear for slight increases to power. The fun of RPGs like this for me is the chase, the rush of getting a new level, and when you hit the level cap so quickly it just feels boring. I was already playing on very hard starting in Act 3 and the game was a breeze, and I'm usually not one to complain about difficulty. My elf archer was basically unstoppable, which was fun, but why bother chasing items when I'm already insanely overpowered? The in-game systems here are also pretty straightforward. You have a boss rush mode, uh, expeditions that just let you do a random zone for loot, relic hunts, which are akin to Path of Exile's map system, but still using the same tile sets and layouts normally, just with modifiers, and invasions, which I frankly didn't even try because at this point I am done with this game. After 11 hours of total playtime and finishing the main four-act campaign, I can safely say that I don't recommend this one at full price at all. I paid $70 for the Magnus Edition so I could have all the DLC in a single shot, and I very much feel like I overpaid. The game is still being worked on, and there is, at the time of recording this, a tower mode being worked on, but unless you are a super hardcore fan of Warhammer Fantasy, you can easily wait for at least a 50% off or higher sale on Chaos Bane. It's a decent game, and I enjoyed my time with it to a point, but there is nothing that makes me want to come back to it or keep playing. The simple fact that I didn't want to go back to do either of the added acts one of which I paid for, and one that was free, should tell you something alone. Just keep in mind that you will want that God Skill DLC pack at the minimum, which is an extra 8 bucks, if you do play this, as that at least adds more variation to how you build each of the heroes. Thanks for watching as always, please treat each other kindly and stay nerdy, and I'll catch you on the next one. Have a great one. Hey there, I just want to say thank you for watching this video, and a special thank you to all my patrons who are listed over there on the right hand of the screen. If you want to get your name in those credits, feel free to check it out at patreon.com slash terminallynerdy. And hey, be kind to each other and stay nerdy. Thanks.